you actually recorded under two names before TG Show. Oh right? man, you've done your homework. <laughs> oh. yeah, that's back when I thought I was Paul Anka. Uh, that was back in the rock and roll days. I tried to make it as a pop act, and um, uh, the name was Brian Stacy, and uh, I had a top twenty, top twenty-five pop record uh, back in the mid '60s with. A song called High School Days. Jerry, Jerry Wexler at Atco Atlantic signed me to a one record deal. Never got an album out of it, but I got a single. Oh, yeah? Okay. On Atco Records. And um, so at that time, uh, that had kind of a ring to it, like, you know, Bobby Rodell and Paul Anka and Brian. Stacy, that's got a good ring, so I've stuck that in you. So <laughs> I've been many people in my life. But obviously country music is kind of where your heart was, and you wound up in Nashville. Yeah. Buddy Killen was... Buddy Killen was my producer. The reason I got into country music was when I was with RCA, I was touring with Waylon and Jesse. And we were sitting here in Nashville one night at the old uh, Ramada Inn down on the circle at the Capitol. And I think they had the disc jockey convention going on. And we were sitting in the hotel room, and he uh, was sitting on the bed, and I'm sitting on the other bed, and he and Jesse were sitting there, and he just started singing a song called, Here's a Taker. And I loved that song. I was promoting it at the time. And I just started singing along with him, you know, and he looked at me and he said, Hoss, what are you doing in the record business? <laughs> I said, well, you know, making a living. He said, you need to be singing country music. <laughs> I said, no. So he handed me his red box guitar, and he said, you play the guitar? I said, no. So he said, here's your first one. And he gave me the guitar. No kidding. And the next week, I cut Devil in the Bottle, and it went number one. Instantly. Wow. Because of Waylon Jennings, I got into country music. That's A lot so of people cool. know that story. A lot of people don't. You know, it, after the flood in Nashville, I was talking to Keith Thurman, everybody that had acoustic guitars. Fortunately, we our stuff was still on the road and yeah. or still in our semis. We were we had just come in, but but um, so we didn't lose anything. But I talked to Vince and I was talking to Keith about all the guitars that he lost because I know he lost oh, ton. Yeah, 20, 30, 40 guitars. And he said the only guitar that I did not lose was Waylon. He really? Had, he has Waylon's Telecaster, the one with the black and Are white. Are you serious? And tool leather the on le it. He does? Yeah. And he said that, you know, he said, and that's like, I feel like I'm the, the keeper of the Holy Grail just having the guitar. Well, yeah. And then when I knew the flag was the first thing that hit me because he was Where's on the guitar? road, he said, and it, and it was there in a case. And, uh, and it was the only guitar he said was totally undamaged it was like it was just mysteriously of course it is protected by that leather well yeah but you would think that also hold the water in yeah he said you know it's the only guitar he had that i was knew he lost a lot of stuff i didn't know he had that guitar yep, yep. i wondered where that guitar was so many times he's got it know. yep and he said it, it came out fine so that was good to know so man you've been you've been through all kind of stuff you've been on tour you went back to your theater where you decided i don't want to tour anymore and then you're like i got to get back on tour and you're just kind of well, you know what that's like i do you know <laughs> yeah, and you're you're, so. you're back rolling and it's kind of fun and you know even when ronnie and i quit touring when i made a couple of movies something yeah. i don't wanted to do but yeah. we toured for 20 years without stopping so i got that out of my system then you know, I kind of rallied the band up. You and know. it's probably f more fun this time <coughs> around than the first it was time. Real, it was real fun. And people, you know, we're old enough. We were 36, 38 when we met. Right. We'd both had our own bands for years. Sure. So it was great to go back out and stir it up again. Did it for a couple of years. And so I kind of know this and that and whatever. But now you go to make a record that you made a duets record, sort of. And had you ever done... A, a, a duets record before? I, I mean, did, well, I did a I did a duet with Clint Eastwood, right? Called "Make My Day," and I did a duet with Karen Brooks, a song that uh, that Bobby Braddock. Um, it, it, a lot of people wrote the song called. Well, I was mistaken Love, for a lot because <laughs> Kay, Kay Brooks was on song credit. Well, yeah, that's right. She got you, credit for right, mine, and I got right, credit for you're hers. You're absolutely <laughs> right, Kay Brooks. <laughs> Um, <coughs> but I did that with Karen, and then I did a, a duet with Judy Collins years and years ago. So not many duets in my career, except 
my wife and I have done a, a duet project called Iconic Duets. But, no, this is the first time I've called in the big gun. So I guess the question is, what inspired you to make this record? Well, i got to be totally honest with you, Kicks. I mean, I've been in this business a long time, my 41st year this year. Uh, lasted much longer than I ever thought it would. And I think we all search for validation in our careers. We, we all search for that one thing in here that may be missing. And a lot of people think, well, if you have number one records, and I've been, so, I've been blessed to have had 21 of those number ones, and I was still very uh, empty. I wasn't fulfilled yet. And I kept thinking, well, what is it going to take to make me feel that I've really done something in my business that has a, that's, that's magic or something special? And I never could find it. So... I did this album, and then after I did this duets album, uh, Legendary Friends and Country Duets, I all of a sudden just filled right up because I knew then that evidently I was worthy or these people wouldn't have come to sing with me. So I felt my worth. And it took this album and 41 years for me to feel like that I'm finally complete. That's when I did the album. That along with... A lot of fans at shows and stuff would come up after the show and go, man, we miss hearing, hearing you on the radio or whatever, and we miss your music, because I haven't done an album like this in 15 years. And uh, we sure wish we could uh, hear some of the voices that we're missing on the radio, and we miss, uh, we miss our country, our country music that we, you know, remember. And so I thought, why not just bring it all back with those voices on one album? So that's, that's how it happened. I think no matter who you are, to me, the, my biggest heroes are some of the most insecure Absolutely. people with their art. That Whether they're songwriters, you know, Bobby Braddock, mm -hmm. or to, to the greatest singers I can think of, it, it always shocks me that they would be intimidated by anything in their yeah. craft. But the question is, you just said it's fulfilling, and, and I totally, that's a great answer, that those people would want to record with you. After you make the call and they say, yes, I can imagine how good that makes you feel. Well, yeah, I was but very... Then, but then, what, what is your feeling when whoever it was, be it Jerry Lee or George Jones or whatever, then what's going on inside of you when, but you still haven't recorded with them. So how does, how does that feel, knowing they're coming to the studio? Right. Now? I'm telling you, it's really, now I can work all day long with these people, and I have toured with every artist that's on this album, whether it's Haggard or Jones or Jerry Lee or Willie Nelson or whoever. Uh, but to actually invite them in to record with you and for them to say, yeah, man, uh, and you're sitting there waiting on them, it's, uh, it's very frightening. It's very, I really thought it was going to be more intimidating. It wasn't intimidating in any way because I already knew these people. Yeah. But it was frightening to me because I didn't want to let them down. Sure. For them to give me their time and come and sing with no questions asked was, uh, man, I, I, I felt very honored. You know, that's, but I was, I was I was frightened every time that a performer would come in because I just didn't want to let down my friends. I wanted to cut a great record that would, uh, you know, maybe last, you know, have some meaning 25 or 30 years from now. And I'm sure they all, each one of them has their own moments. But as you started making this album, was there... Was there one moment when you're on when you're on the microphone when you're doing a duet with somebody when you go, oh man, I knew this was going to be fun, but I didn't know it was going to be this good. Well, yeah, that was that was basically on every cut, <laughs> but there was one night I got to share something very special. I'm sure you toured with Conway. I, I mean, everybody you never did, but knew him. Yeah. A lot of us toured with Conway when we were first starting out, whether it was George Strait or Kenny Rogers. or who, I mean, We all toured with Conway. And my wife, Kelly Lang, a great singer-songwriter, her father was Conway's road manager. And 
I would hang out with Conway and became very good friends and we <laughs> we were business partners in a lot of things together. And I, I lost a fortune every time I got in business with Conway. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> every time. <laughs> so um, I couldn't do this album without having Conway. Of course, and Conway's been gone a long time. I'm getting around to answering your question uh -huh. for you. Um, yeah. So I went to the estate and to the family and asked them, I said, I want to use Conway's voice on Why Me, Lord, but I do not want to touch in any way his rendition because that's sacred to me. It should never be touched. But I want to go in and build a whole new track and he and I to do a duet together. So I came in off the road and I was in the studio and I walked up to the mic it was late, and I, I was really tired, about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I put the phones on, and I walk up to the mic, and I heard this, I heard his voice, why me, Lord? And, and I'm telling you, the tears just started flowing. It was a very yeah. emotional thing because I knew at that moment that he uh, was there with me. Felt his presence mm -hmm. as if he was standing uh, across from me singing. So, yeah, there was, there was a magical thing that happened and that feeling every time I did a duet with any of these people because they're my heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the people that I look up to and who I've respected. And, and there are those voices that you know who they are. Instantly, when you hear their voice on the radio, you know it's a, a Willie or a Jerry Lee or a Haggard or a Mickey Gilly or the Oaks or Lori Morgan. Crystal Gale, you know these people. I mean, you know their voices. And so, yeah, but you're right, though. It was more fun than I ever thought it would be. <laughs> and I had a blast, I, you know. But uh, hopefully we made a little history with this music because it's, it's really a different kind of sound on a lot of stuff. Well, you have this treasure now. You've been through the process. You've had the ex this fulfilling experience. So... The old promotion guy in you knows that times have changed since you were working records, you know. Yep. Uh, you're not butting heads with Florida Georgia Line. Nope. What nope. do you do with this treasure? How do you how do you make sure that all your fans <clears throat> Somebody the other day said, Well, what if it doesn't sell? Because the chances of being on radio with it pretty slim, you know. And I said, You know what? I've already been paid in here. I've already had the incredible feeling of having a hit album if it never sells a copy because it filled me up. It was that thing that was missing in here for 41 years finally was fulfilled. <laughs> um, I, I think great music uh, or any music always finds its way. And um, hopefully it'll find its way. Uh, we're living in a new world now of downloads and with iTunes and Amazon and and people can find what they want out there. So if they hear by word of mouth that you've done something that's intriguing to them, hopefully they'll go and they'll download a song or an album or whatever. But uh, you know, it's, it is a new day. It's a whole new day. But God, what an exciting day this is, you know. Social media now has come into play so great. I wish we that I had had it back in the 70s when I was taking off in the 80s. I wish social media was there then because we could have reached so many people instantly uh, like they are today. But we have it today, so we'll use social media to get the word out about legendary friends and country duets. We'll do our part. Thanks for you coming always in. Do. Are you kidding me? It is great to see You're you. You're one of my mentors, my friend. Oh, man, we could sit here and do this all day, buddy. Well, I'm, <laughs> no, I could. I, I mean that, man. I, I, uh, I have been a, uh, not only a friend— you and I are friends, but I've always uh, respected you and looked up to how you've handled your life and career. Well, you're very nice. Thanks. Great to have you in, TJ.